Hey everybody, this is a very, very short talk on the Sharvakas, one of the unorthodox non-Hindu schools of ancient, the golden age of ancient Indian thought, which is important in the context of Buddhist philosophy and thought and Indian philosophy. So this is a part of a series on videos about Buddhist thought, and the Sharvakas should be mentioned. There are several schools of Indian Hindu thought. Those are considered the orthodox Hindu schools. Then there are non-orthodox, unorthodox, non-Hindu schools. And those, the three most important ones, the three that were very famous in the golden age of ancient India, which is around 600, 500, 400 BCE is when some of the, uh, the Buddha was alive and when Mahavir, the Jain founder and others, were around. The Sharvakas were the, after the Buddhists and the Jains, were the third most famous school of ancient Indian thought and skepticism. Uh, the non-orthodox, unorthodox, non-Hindu schools, Buddhism and Jainism, tend to be rather skeptical about the human mind and what reality can be known. Against the Nyaya and the Vaisheshika of the Hindus, uh, Gautama and Kannada, who argued for something more like objective atomic truth, Buddhists and Jains often argue that there are many sides of the elephant and things are subjective in debate, meaning that they are temporary and somewhat in time and somewhat in space, but not absolute and permanent, which is what these debates are about. Is fire absolutely hot? Is it relatively hot? Uh, examples like that were debated in ancient times, and they were in India as well as in Greece and in China by philosophers when all of this was very much religion and science as well. The Sharvakas are not nearly as still going as the Buddhists and the Jains. They are still major world religions, with the Jains uh, oh, about four million, I believe, or so Jains today, many living in Toronto. But the Sharvakas, as far as I understand, do not currently have a following, kind of like the nihilists of Russia Nietzsche was concerned with. They don't seem to be around so much anymore but I haven't hung out with nihilists in Russia, at least not lately. But the Sharvakas are hardcore skeptics. In debates about subjectivity and objectivity, the Sharvakas are good to bring up as an interesting outlier, which is excellent for talk about Greek, Chinese, Indian, or Western, modern, American, or European philosophy. That the Sharvakas believe in perception, like the Vaisheshika and the Nyaya. The Nyaya, the logicians, much like Aristotle of ancient India, would say you are surrounded by perception so much, your eyes and your ears so often don't lie to you. It's very Wittgensteinian to say we'd live very differently if our eyes most often lied to us. That would be a very different world. And if I looked outside and saw elephants floating through the sky, I would trust my ears enough to ask my friend, hey, what's going on? And hopefully it didn't just come out, wah, 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 and I'm totally nuts. But while we're in the game of trusting our ears and eyes and then testimony that others say of the Nyaya when they parse all this out as Indian logic, that an argument for debate, which is what ancient logic was, not so much math, more debate and argument. What is logical, Captain? But the Vaisheshika and the Nyaya, who are the cosmologists and logicians of ancient India, they believed in inference, inference and inherence, which means that there are groups of things like hot things or horned animals, and then all cows have horns. But the Sharvakas took the radical skeptical position, which some have taken something like this in various positions in human thought, and it is not entirely wrong. It is oddly like uh, Wittgenstein saying solipsism is one end of the human condition. It's not all of it, but it is a little bit undeniable that we know that we ourselves are conscious. We do not know necessarily, see that others see, but we feel as if and act as if others see with their eyes, but do not see what they see with their eyes. So we do not know that others are conscious entirely. Similar to that sort of solipsism or skepticism about about zombies, a la Chalmers or not, the Sharvakas went further about physical perception. While some people are worried about whether or not people or Turing tests exist or not, the Sharvakas say Paris, France, and physics and everything that you do not see with your eyes is an illusion of the mind. That means, for me and you, gravity exists in stuff going downwards decently, as far as we explain it right now, post-Newton. Einstein didn't like gravity entirely, but Newton still is carrying the day with gravity. So, 
Einstein didn't get up to that enough. So for the moment, we see everything go downward, and that's here, but on the other side of Alpha Centauri or in another part of this universe, we do not know. So you become radically more so agnostic, and you say, I'm not even sure if Paris, France exists right now. That is all speculative. I can speculate like that, and you can speculate as to the emotions of anyone in human history, Napoleon, whatever have you, and you can believe, well, perhaps he was born in 17, you know, uh, 20, I don't know. This is thankfully not entirely the French history class here, but essentially all of that is assumption. Now that is a position which typically you would find amongst the more subjective side of human thought. Hume, the Scottish skeptic, the greatest uh, Scottish philosopher, because he is the most well-known only Scottish philosopher to a lot of folks, therefore he is the best and the worst, is that he said all truth is habit, prejudice, and assumption. That's actually what the Sharvacus are saying. They then go a little farther than some others and say, therefore you should uh, sit still, eat well, uh, argue with others, and Paris, France effectively for you and I does not exist. So we can use our thought as tools, but gravity existing fully throughout the cosmos, numbers being real beyond human practices, your grained on Susan wandering out of the room and still existing. All of that is as much as you know it, and that is as much as you see it or know it. You do not know it beyond perception much in the slightest. In other words, all inference and reasoning of the mind, any way that people who believe in the subjective or objective would draw syllogisms or forms of reasoning like the Nyaya and Aristotle discuss would be temporary, useful, pragmatic illusions. Yes, and we can only merely use our illusions as Guns N' Roses attempted to do in the early 90s. Yes, and as I attempt to use humor poorly. So it is similar, in fact, in an odd way to Wittgenstein's famous opening of the Tractatus, which is not my favorite part of Wittgenstein. I prefer the investigations and on certainty. He says in though he opens the work saying the world consists of facts, not of things. And this is not to say that early Wittgenstein is not a, uh, well, that he is neither solipsist nor Sharvika, but for early Wittgenstein, the group of all lions in our head, rather like Avicenna and a bit of the uh, great Islamic philosopher and logician and a bit very much like the Sharvikas, what that means is, is that what you and I understand about Paris, France is largely not a physical thing we see or hear. It is largely a construct of our minds and a useful illusion. This does get towards what many po in postmodern times would say, and I think that they are right on that end of it as well, is that in a way what you understand about your ethnicity, your religion, your nation is something that has to be learned through others, has to be a process you go through. And if it is, and if it is mainly in the mind, if you can't see all of your people or all uh, see all of the Catholic ceremonies all at once through a strange camera system, then in a certain sense, we are trusting others to simply use the illusion, and we have a large illusion of what's going on with the Catholic Church, with America, etc. But we do not see it, so we have to assume it, and that means it is not only socially constructed, but the Sharvikas point is that much more like early Wittgenstein, who is not very social of a guy in his theory or in his, uh, in his self, off in a cabin, you know, in the woods, is that... It is a self-construct to have your understanding of who you are, what your ethnicity, religion, gender, anything is. In a certain sense, it is all assumed in the mind that I know what a male is, what this is, what that is, is as much as I have gathered myself. So that sense, it is not just socially constructed, it is individually constructed, and our minds are full of illusions. And we learn this all the time. The Nyaya would say, and then you shave off those and you're left with a whole lot of objective truth. The Sharvakas are radical nope. And yeah, there's a lot of that in Buddhism and Jainism, but Buddhism and Jainism tend to be a bit more proactive about transforming the self. The Sharvakas, hilariously, while they are saying, well, you can theorize that rain comes from clouds all the time, and that's great if you're doing weather, but if you're not, let's just not assume that, and that's part of everything. Other schools essentially say that the Sharvikas failed to explain where consciousness comes from. And the Shar Sharvikas used to say it's kind of like alcohol. It just kind of comes together, ferments, it arises out of things. 
and then it just goes back in everything again. It's not clear how much they would have thought the universe is alive, full of spirits and, and forces, probably as ancient people. So there's the big reincarnation recycling program. It does actually say in the few fragments of text that we have, the Sharvicus say, you know, just enjoy life. It's kind of a temporary thing. And I, it does say in there, enjoy a, a song and dance. And I believe the text actually does say in the co and the company of young women. It actually mentions in the text this video is kid friendly on YouTube. Therefore, yes, everyone danced the waltz, and it was nice. And they had punch. It was amazing. Um, and they all enjoyed the company of young women, men, you know, the elderly, you know, on the street, etc. So yeah, the Sharvikas say enjoy life, party a bit, you know, a little bit Epicurus here, although he seems a little, uh, well, I'm not sure how disciplined the Sharvikas are, because unfortunately, unlike the Epicureans, they did not last all that long, it would seem. Um, not sure exactly what happened to them or how much that was blended into Jainism or Buddhism itself. But Jainism and Buddhism tends to share many sides of the elephant kind of arguments. And those would be very Sharvaka. And they are, in a sense, the hardcore solipsists about the world of ancient India. They are somewhat the early Vikensinians, but they are strangely more skeptical about the, about the structures of thought. So that beeping outside means that's our time. So yes, hopefully you learned a thing or two about the Sharvakas and human thought, and I will see you when I see you. Otherwise, you don't exist. And when I stop hearing that beeping, it won't either.